Hi, I'm Mike Reed, Dean of the College of Health and Human Performance at the University of Florida, which is the home of the Eric Friedheim Tourism Institute. I'm here today to interview Ms. Edith Hall Friedheim, who helped to found the Institute, which is named after her husband, Eric, a giant in the field of travel publishing and her husband for many years. I think you'll find it fascinating. Edith has a great story to tell. So we warmly welcome you on behalf of the Institute to this interview. Well, as you know, I was born and raised in Canada, in Toronto. And from the age of five, I wanted nothing else but to be a concert pianist. And that began when I went to a movie. My friend's father took us to a movie and I was five years old, we were both five. And I came home from the movie and my mother asked me, how, did, how was it? How did you like your first movie? And I burst into tears and I was inconsolable. Oh, how sad. And my poor mother thought it was violence or something in the movie. But apparently through my tears, I said, the music was so beautiful. <laughs> So my mother called the movie theater and asked what the soundtrack was of the movie that they were showing. In those days, you could reach someone at the movie theater. It turned out that the soundtrack was the Rachmaninoff Second Piano Concerto. Oh, lovely. So my mother knew she had a weirdo on her hands. <laughs> and I started piano lessons, and that's what I did and what I wanted to do. Then when I was 14, my piano teacher asked me to get a copy of the Chopin etudes. I was ready to begin playing some of the easier ones. And I got an edition, a Shermer edition, that was the famous yellow yeah. cover. Yes, yes. that, do you? Yes, of course. And there was a name across the front cover, Friedheim. And that was Arthur Friedheim, who was a very, very well-known pianist a great pianist, yes. a student of Franz Liszt, and he had edited these Chopin etudes. Each etude had a paragraph that he had written, and I was so impressed and so in awe of his insight into these very obtuse, abstract pieces, right? Yes. And I knew that he was some kind of a genius. So I started to research him and found out about his career and so forth. He lived in New York, he taught, he concertized and so forth and so on. And I went about my business and became a concert pianist, moved to New York because that was where you had to be if you wanted to make a living in the arts. And I moved there when I was 18. What, was, was that move a shock? Was, was the culture no, in New York very different? No, it was like my home. Really? My parents were very um, keen on the arts. They, were, they both played the piano quite well, and they were great museum goers and concert goers and theater goers. So every Christmas, we went to New York for about 10 uh, days uh, uh, when I was in the city. Yeah. Yeah. And all I wanted was to move there eventually. But when I was 17, I was accepted as a student at Tanglewood. And that was a very, very big honor. Of course. And while I was at Tanglewood, I met a composer and his wife, who was a pianist. They were Canadians. And they were uh, in, involved with the, Manhattan, with the Manus College of Music in New York. And they said to me, you really need to come to Manus in the fall. New York is definitely where you want to be. And I said, my parents have already enrolled me at Oberlin in Ohio, and they've already paid, you know, put a huge down payment. And they said, well, you've got to come to New York. So after Tanglewood, I went back to Toronto and announced to my parents, I wasn't going to Oberlin after all. My goodness. And that How did they I handle that? Did they put up with it all right? To it because I was a very rebellious kid. <laughs> I and my brother both. We 
we we just did what we what we felt we had to do and i knew right. i had to go to new york so they accepted it and i went anyway eventually i ended up in cleveland and i loved it i taught at the cleveland institute of music yes wonderful school i got married there and i had a child and by and by we moved to new york I had already lived in New York, gone to Cleveland, and then moved back to New York. My husband was an artist. He was a full professor at Pratt Institute in the art department. I see. And I was teaching and playing in New York. So it was a very, very rich life. You know the story about my working for Isaac Stern, I'm sure. Yeah, but I think we need to hear that for this recording. I think we need to hear that story. Isaac Stern needed um, an administrative assistant part-time, and I was hired. And my job was to... Wait, 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 wait. How did you just happen to know Isaac Stern? Well, That's not trivial. I, I was pretty well known by that time. The music industry, like any other, is such that you get a huge attrition rate, Mike. Mm. Most people drop out. Yep. Because for one thing, practicing an instrument is so difficult and so time consuming. And then getting work is almost impossible. I was lucky. I was a very good teacher and I loved it. So I always had lots of teaching. But, and I met somebody who was um, Isaac Stern's manager. Uh. And she hired me. And so I went to work for the great man. You know that he was a very famous violinist, of course. Of course, of course, sure. So I was to type his correspondence. He got a lot of mail, mostly fan mail, and he answered every single letter. And I had to type from a dictating machine. And he would come down after a day or two and say, Edith, have you got some letters for me to sign? And I would say, I'm working on one, Mr. Stern. <laughs> And we went to his mother's apartment for lunch. He was lovely to me. He really was. I met his children and his wife. He worked in his apartment. So about three weeks into this job, he called me into his office and said to me, you know, I've had a very serious heart attack. And I said, I know, Mr. Stern. And he said, and my doctor tells me I need a full-time secretary. Oh, I can work full time, Mr. Stern. <laughs> I could never forgive myself if I asked you to do that. You have much more important work to do. I couldn't bear it if I stood in the way of your career. So I left feeling 10 feet tall. And about two years later, I was walking down Broadway and it suddenly hit me that he had fired me. And I didn't <laughs> even know it. I thought he was making the big sacrifice for my career. It was a great lesson to learn <laughs> in how to do something, you know, how to, how to, how to let somebody go, how to fire them and, and <laughs> have them realize it, right? So that was that. And um, I just, you know, did, did my thing. And eventually I burned out. I didn't want to practice piano anymore. Yes. I had been doing it all day, every day since I was five years old. I had remarried, I had met Eric in the most wonderful way because I had gotten into travel writing. Again, by chance, I met someone who needed a researcher to update two books, one on New York and one on Washington and Virginia, both for Froman. Mm -hmm. So very, I- thought, Very famous publisher. In, very famous, very, very. very. And so I applied by, uh, they told me to write a restaurant review. And if they liked it, they would hire me. Well, I had a daughter who was a French trained chef and had a restaurant in New York. She went with me to Le Bernardin and I wrote a review and they liked the review. So I was hired. When I was updated, the review ever published? Did oh yes, in the, this, in the, the there, yes, in the Fromer books. Yeah, right. I did a lot of restaurants and a lot of museums and hotels for. You know. So anyway, the time came when I really needed a full time job. I had gotten divorced, 
and I had no money and my children were in college. It sounds quite dire. It was dire, but it wasn't the first time it was dire. I had a lot of dires in my, in my, <laughs> yeah, because in the arts, it, it just is that way, as you know, yep. probably. Yep. So I met somebody and the woman, actually the woman that I wrote the uh, updates for the Fromer books for, she said, you need a full-time job. I used to work for Eric Friedheim. He owns a travel magazine for the industry. It's called Travel Agent Magazine. It was a weekly publication, which at one point he had to publish twice a week because of the competition coming along and publishing twice a week. It was a very competitive business. She said, would you like me to call him for you? I hear he's looking for a wife. <laughs> and I would like to get back in touch with him for my own sake. Uh, uh, uh. And you would be the hook. <laughs> and I said, thank you, I would love that. That sounds wonderful. So she called this Eric Friedheim person and he agreed to talk to me on the phone. And I called him and I fell madly in love with him on the phone because he had a gorgeous voice, very cultured. He had been born in London and he had a little bit of that patrician speech do you know what i mean yes of course very and he agreed to see me he agreed to see me so i went over to his office and we had an interview and he told me that he never did any of the hiring because he couldn't bear to fire anybody if it didn't work out <laughs> so <laughs> he had his editor do all the hiring and anyway there were no jobs at the magazine but would i like to go to dinner and I said, that would be very nice. And he said to me, well, by the way, what did you do before you were a travel writer? And I said, I was a pianist. He started to say my father was a pianist when I put it together. Ah, uh, yes, of course. You know, 40 years later in a different country, in a different life, on a different planet, here was Arthur Friedheim's son the person that I had worshipped all my, all my childhood. It really sounds faded, Edith. I think, it, I, I often think that it was faded. Yeah. Because there was no adjustment period at all when we got married. It was as if we had been, you know, together in some other life. He had been very happily married to his first wife, Betty. And she had died very tragically at the age of 64. He had been a widower for a number of years, but he wanted to remarry because she had made him so happy. He yeah. wanted to try again, you know. So we made a dinner date and he was late. And I had a policy of not waiting longer than 10 minutes for anybody. So I left the restaurant. <laughs> I bet few people did that to Eric Friedheim. Nobody did that to Eric Friedheim. He had the half of the women in New York falling at his feet. I mean, he, he, he had dated everyone in the travel industry in New York. My goodness. And I bumped into him. He was coming into the restaurant and I was, he said, where are you going? And I said, don't worry about it. It's fine. I just don't wait longer than 10 minutes for anybody, but it was lovely meeting you and bye-bye. Oh no, please come back, please. So he cajoled me into going back into the restaurant. And that's how it started. Yeah. So that, that your relationship with Eric must have been extremely rich. It must have had so many elements to it. What, if anything, because this was obviously a very prominent man and you probably knew a lot about him going into the relationship, what surprised you most about Eric? What surprised me about Eric was the combination of patrician, elegant, tall, handsome, man and street fighter. He was a real down dirty kid. He had grown up poor in the Bronx. He was in lots of fights when he was a kid. His mother bought him a printing press when he was eight years old and he, like I decided to be a pianist at five. He became a writer at eight, never did anything else. Really? He wrote a, he wrote a newspaper when he was eight years old. My goodness. And, and how did that get distributed? in the neighborhood. Ah. Then his father was hired in Toronto of all places to, to uh, start a music school there. 
and they lived in a residential hotel in Toronto and Eric published the newspaper in the hotel, put it under the doors of all the residents there. And, you know, Mrs. Jones had a baby last week, Mr. Smith got a new job, you know. So he always did that, never, never deviated from that at all. So that's another aspect of your history that's shared. You both were in Toronto. Very much so, but we weren't there at the same time and we weren't the same age. He was a great deal older than I was, but he was close in age to my mother. Huh? They went to the same school in really? Toronto. Yeah. And they didn't, they didn't know each other, I no, guess. No. No, Eric was, about, was amazing. Eric was about 10 when he lived in Toronto. And his father was a very difficult man. Loving father and husband, but a very difficult man. And he wasn't rehired after the first two years in Toronto. Really? So they went back to New York and that's where he stayed until he joined the army during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Where did he serve? In, uh, in, in um, Germany and, and England. I see. He, he took the officer candidate training school program. Mm -hmm. He had a classmate by the name of Clark Gable. <laughs> As a, another another person a few folks know. Right. And he was an officer right from the very beginning. Yes. He was shot out of a plane in Germany um, and parachuted into a tree. They never found the pilot. Oh my goodness. He was writing, Eric was writing for the um, new, um, Air Force newspaper. He was in the Air Force yes. and he was writing for their newspaper, but he was shot out of a plane. He had offered to fly this mission to report on it, to write about it. He was shot out. He, he, parachuted and got caught in a, tree, in a tree. And there was a password for the allies, if you were an ally. And the password was hither and thither, because Germans can't pronounce TH at all. Really? Yeah. So hither and thither is not something any German could possibly have used. And that's the password that he used when he saw an allied troop come along. And they got him down from the tree and took him. They had just blown up a railroad station and sent him out with the stretcher to bring the dead bodies back. Oh. And he told me that never, ever again did he realize how heavy a dead body was to carry. Yeah. A tough lesson to learn. He wrote a book about it called Fighters Up. It's a very interesting book. It's about that mission and about having gotten shot out of the plane and that whole story. He stayed in the reserves, Mike, till he was 65, which was a wonderful move. He was a very practical man and he got marvelous benefits mm. you know, uh, from that. And the first job he had after that was as a freelance journalist. And then after that, he got a job as the advance man for the freedom train. So tell me, tell me about that train, because that's a part of American history that I'm not very familiar with. It was a train that carried all of the documents, our U.S. American documents, such as the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, all of the official documents were on this train, and it stopped at every town throughout the South. So this was during the civil rights movement. This was in the mid 60s? No, this would have been in the 50s. The oh. early, late 40s and early 50s. I see. Because the war was over in 1945. Yeah. So he probably was working for the Freedom Train two or three years later than that. And he was struck by the injustice of the Freedom Train because the appointments were made in every town for the white population to come uh, at a certain time on a certain day and the black population to come at a different time on a different day. So he often said to me, the worst thing that can happen to you is to be born black in this country. Yeah. It made a very, very terrible impression on him that that happened. It's, it's so impressive that he was a strong voice for that yeah. inequity 
um, so early in, yeah. in our country's life. He really was. He was just struck by that and, and never got over it because he said it often during the late years that we were together. Yes. Do, do you think that it influenced his writing or his, his publications in any way? I don't think so. No. I don't think so. He was strictly, a, you know, a, 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 an industry, a travel industry writer, and that's what he did. He founded the Society of American Travel Writers, SATW. Yes. He, he was on the advisory board of the President of the United States' uh, Caucus on Tourism. That's really what he did. And he traveled, and that's what he did. And it was competitive, and he had, you know, he had... He had to be very, very watchful. Uh, somebody set a fire in his office one time. Really? And why was that? Yes. One of the competitors, he's pretty sure, or it was an inside job. It comes back to your, your comment that he was a real scrappy guy. He was a scrappy guy, but a very, but a very fair guy and, and a very decent man, you know, but he had this low down journalist streak, you know, where he would walk over the dead bodies to get the story. <laughs> the story was everything, absolutely everything. And the journalists that worked for him, the ones that walked over the dead bodies after the assassination were the ones that he liked and hired too. Yeah. Because that's what makes a journalist. Absolutely. Right. So, so then a couple of years after that, he found out that a magazine called Travel Agent was for sale. And it had been started in the 40s, and this was 1951, and he decided to try to buy that magazine. Okay, good. And he had no money. He bought it with other people's money. But he did buy it and turned it around and made it, you know, wonderfully successful for many, many, many years until ABC Capital Cities bought it in the late 90s. Oh my goodness, so he, he published that magazine for many decades. Yes, he did, from 1951 until, uh, I mean, he was still the editor-in-chief when he was dying. Oh, bless him. So he had sold it, and the and ABC Capital Cities took it down the tubes. Mm. So they hired a consultant at $50,000 to tell them what to do. And the consultant studied the situation and told them to get Friedheim back running the magazine. <laughs> so $50,000 later, they hired Eric back as <laughs> the editor-in-chief. And the magazine was up and running again. What a fantastic story. That is yeah. just terrific. It really is. And it was a wonderful magazine, but there was competition. And he and the main his main competitor had a falling out uh, and didn't speak and this was difficult because they ended up at the same dinners every night you know the travel industry is a very big entertainment industry and they didn't speak a word they were seated together all the time but they ooh, never spoke a word how after, awkward <laughs> after a few years they were at a luncheon and eric turned to robbie eric, Ro Robinson and said, would you mind telling me why we're not speaking? Could you, would you mind telling me? And Robinson said, I'm damned if I can remember. <laughs> and then they became very good friends. And we saw a lot of them in Florida. They eventually moved to Florida. Oh, that's terrific. And, yes. And his magazine was Travel Weekly, which was another very, very successful magazine. Yeah, 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 yeah. What a great story. It's still going, but of course he isn't with it anymore. Yeah. And Eric was, um, his wife died, his first wife died quite young. And one of the people he dated was a movie star named Piper Laurie. Yeah, sure, very famous. She was in a movie or two with Paul Newman. Mm -hmm. And after we got married, she called him. She didn't realize he was married. She lived in California, but she spent a lot of time in New York. So she didn't realize he was married and he, she called and I answered the phone and I said, you know, is, she said, is Eric there? I said, yes, who's calling? She said, this is Piper Laurie. So I put my hand over the phone. I said, Eric, Eric, it's Piper Laurie, the movie star. Invite her over, invite her over. And 
So he got on the phone and talked to her. She was calling to tell him that she had a new grandchild and she was going to be in New York and could they get together and so forth. And he told her that he was married and she wished him well, but he didn't invite her over. No. And I never forgave him for that. <laughs> well, I'm sure poor Piper Laurie would have been brokenhearted to realize the competition to which she lost. Right. <laughs> I think she would have handled it very, very well. <laughs> So in, in your relationship with Eric, did your, um, your work as a travel writer, was that an important part of y'all's relationship since you both really were in the same industry? Um, Eric was terrified of being accused of nepotism. Oh, yeah. So he would never give me an assignment, ever. I had to go behind his back and, and deal with the different editors, the Europe editor, the Caribbean editor, um, you know, and I would ask them for assignments. And I was very good at what I did, and I loved it. And um, they always gave me assignments, but he never did. As he got older and sicker, I didn't want to leave him. Yes. And I kept getting assignments to places like China, mm. India, Africa. And these were long trips. Yes. Many press trips are just a few days, you know, four or five days, but those were, because of the distances, those were much farther and difficult to, to be in touch with him. And I mentioned it to him, you know, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be in China. And he said, oh, but you have to. I mm -hmm. said, no, why? Because Think how I would feel if you didn't go, if I were to deny you that trip. Think how I would feel, how guilty I would feel. And he did this all the time. A very selfless I, man in that regard. And I'd say to him, as long as you make sure that you have flowers waiting for me when I get back. <laughs> and for the rest, rest of his life, he did. So, Every time I went on a press trip and came back, there were flowers. That is so sweet. Yeah. yeah. T tell me a little bit, while, while we're on the topic of you and your international travel, do, do you have memories or, or trips that were particularly formative for you, memories that you still treasure? Very much so. Um, China, of course, was like no other trip, right? Because it's like no other place in the world. And I was there at the time that they were just finishing up the dam and they were relocating all the people from the ancient villages across the river, across the Yangtze, to yeah. these awful cookie cutter apartments. It was very, very sad, very poignant. And then Eric and I had a cruise on the Amur River, which separates Russia from um, Mongolia, I think. Mm -hmm. That was a cruise from hell. Eric told me his first wife was, uh, but it was very, very interesting because it was the Russian Far East and nobody had ever been there. Yes, All yes. they had there were, were war monuments. So that was a very interesting trip as well. So this was during the Cold War then? No, this was, no. No, this wasn't during, well, I, yeah, I guess it was. This was in the 90s. All of these trips were in the oh, 90s. Yeah. I understand. Yeah, yeah that's, that's much later on then. Yeah. And then, I mean, we, we were always traveling, always. He would get up in the morning and say, let's go to Washington for lunch. And we did. Um, another memorable trip was we went, we went to London often because that was Eric's hometown. Yes. And we booked a tour of Buckingham Palace because it had not been available for tours. It had been closed to people. But it opened, and so Eric was very keen to see it. Mm, of course. So we booked a tour, and we were getting up in the morning to take the tour when the phone rang at 6.30 a.m. in our hotel room. And it was Buckingham Palace to tell us that the tours had been canceled because Princess Diana had been killed oh. the night before. Oh, how horrible. And so that was memorable. Yes, yes, yes. Eric said, let's get out of London. I said, well, where will we go? I don't know. We'll go to the train station and we'll see where, where they're going. So we went to the train station. There was a train leaving for Brighton. And we went to Brighton, which was a marvelous place. 
Yeah. We saw Lawrence Olivier's home there. It was, it was, it, there's the big, this big, huge uh, building there. And it's, it's very beachy and very lively. We had a wonderful day there. It and must then, have been marvelous traveling with Eric. The two of you knew so much about, uh, about foreign countries and foreign culture. Yeah. Yeah, well, he was, but, but travel industry people are not interested in the destination at all. The destination has no interest for them. It really? is the logistics of moving the bodies back and forth that interests them. The train schedules, the bus schedules, the flights, that's what interests them. D did you take many cruises with Eric? No, he hated cruising. Really? He hated it. His friend Sid Geffen, whom you know, whom very you, well. Sid loved cruises. He was a big shot on Holland America, and he was always cruising. He was always begging us to go on a cruise. So Eric finally capitulated for Alaska, the Inside Passage, yes. and we went there. But he didn't do any of the excursions, and he didn't like being confined in a cruise ship. In, in your stories, you, you, you frequently mention trains and train station and train travel. Was that a favorite form of travel for Eric? Yes. He was fascinated with trains and schedules, train schedules. I might have told you the story of our honeymoon where we were at the Savoy Hotel. No, no. You haven't told me. Okay. Please so do. We got there and we unpacked. We flew the Concorde because he was always upgraded. And we got there after two, a long lunch two and a half, three hours. And he said, let's go somewhere. I said, what, we just got here. He said, well, let's take a boat somewhere. And I said, where? He said, I don't know, we'll go down to the Thames and we'll see where they're going. So we went down to the Thames and there was a boat going to Greenwich. Yeah, sure. So we went to Greenwich. Remember, we had just arrived in London. We hadn't even really unpacked yet. You must have been jet lagged out of your socks. <laughs> Well, not really, because the Concorde is a very easy. Oh, of course, ship. you said the Concorde, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a day flight, and it's very short. It's interesting, because you go through the sound barrier. You break the sound barrier. What was that experience like? Were you aware of it on the plane? Yeah, because you had a television set that showed you the atmosphere. It was very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And only about a three-hour flight back then. Yes, right. right. Amazing. It was wonderful. It was too expensive to maintain, and so it eventually folded, but and it, it, people couldn't afford it, and British Airways and Air France couldn't really afford to sustain these aircraft, you know, so it did fold. Then the next day we got up and we had breakfast, and Eric said, let's go to Edinburgh. I've never been to Edinburgh. <laughs> so said, he went to London, but didn't go to London. He went everywhere but London. And so I said, um, well, we just got to London. Well, why don't we spend a few days in London? No, I, <laughs> I really would like to go to Edinburgh. I said, why? He said, because there's a wonderful new train there called the Royal Scotsman. And it does Edinburgh in five hours or six hours. And it's supposed to be a wonderful ride. So, but, all right. I said, well, how long will we stay in Edinburgh? He said, one night. <laughs> And I said, Eric, I don't think I want to ride 12 hours in a train for one night. He said, okay, we'll fly one way. <laughs> so it's just as you said, he cared it's, as much about the travel and logistics as he did about the destination. About the logistics. He was yeah. really not interested in Edinburgh, but in that Royal Scotsman. Uh, and we did the same thing in the um, Highlands. We took a train through the Highlands. It was just wonderful. It's a beautiful it's part of it. Every town is gorgeous, and every town is more gorgeous than the last one, and that was really quite wonderful. Then, of course, we went to all the SAT conventions, all the travel industry conventions. We went to Cairo, and we went to Taipei. We were, I, I'm one of the few people Rachel knows here who's been to Taiwan. That's fantastic. Yeah. What an exotic life you've lived. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was fine. I have no complaints. Absolutely none. None whatsoever. It was, it was a magical life. We are, and in many ways, it still is. Well, we, and we are delighted to have you with us to, to help us with all the work that we do and to hear these marvelous stories. But we're also honored to have this institute named for your husband. Um, the, I'm 
so that, grateful for that and to Sid Geffen and Hal Herman and you. I'm so grateful for that. He, it would have been so meaningful to him, Mike, because tr travel and tourism was his entire life. Yes. Tell, Edith, tell me what it's like to play on stage at Carnegie Hall. It's very scary. It's very but, scary. Was, was it a, a full public recital? Was it a part of a, a public? It was a two public? piano recital. Oof. I had a two piano team and it was a two piano recital. And the problem with performing, Mike, in Carnegie Hall or anywhere else is memory. Pianists are the only people who have to memorize the music. Mm. And you have no idea how scary that is. Mm. Because you trust something that's called muscle memory, which doesn't exist. It really doesn't. And you uh, inevitably are going to have a memory lapse. Yeah. Nobody doesn't. Everybody does. Yeah. But that knowledge is just enough to paralyze you. And Very yet... You, and yet you had a career, and yet you were successful in that regard. That's fantastic. Well, because I loved what I was doing, and, and I loved um, teaching. I loved teaching. That was, I was, I felt so lucky to have done that all my life, and, and I was so good at it. You know, I was a very, very good teacher. Can you and, tell us a, a little bit about that? Because you did teaching one-on-one -on -one with students in New York, and then you went to Cleveland and you were on faculty at a, at an, at a right, right. That was one on one too. Was um, it? Yeah, I, I taught piano and chamber music, and I loved it. I never lost a student, and I taught everybody from the age of about six to eighty. My goodness. You no, know, I would have a. I had a, a, a an adult student who asked me one day, "When can I play the Rachmaninoff Concerto?" And I said, "How's never? Is never good for you?" And <laughs> <laughs> I I teased them a lot, you know, and um, it worked. I was I was a very happy teacher. Well, you must have been patient <laughs> if you taught people at such extreme ages. I wasn't patient at all. I would say to them. Hey, it seems like I'm doing all the work here. <laughs> <laughs> this is a partnership, you know. <laughs> Before we go, you, you've been an educator, you've been a travel writer, you've been involved in the industry at the very highest levels. I wonder, what advice would you have for our students in our college? What, what would you recommend to them? You mean in tourism, travel, hospitality. Yeah, exactly. I would, the, I, I don't know as I would have any advice. I would say to them, you are the luckiest person alive because you are studying and preparing for the most fascinating field. There is nothing but nothing more all embracing, more global, than this field. It's wonderful. And I really feel that it's a privilege to be able to work in it. And there are so many different aspects and so many different opportunities. And you just have to choose one. And I mean, I, for me, it was travel writing. I loved it. And I didn't choose it. It chose me, really. But I think hotel management, I think hospitality is wonderful. I think cruising would be wonderful now, especially. Yes. Because as you know, the cruise ships are in deep trouble and now they're doing cruises to Singapore and cruises, you know, unusual ones. And I think it's a good time to be in that business. Mm. Very good. Watch, you'll see it's changing drastically. Few people have led such interesting lives and have such wonderful stories to tell. Thank you so much, Edith. It's a pleasure. And for me, a pleasure. Great pleasure, Mike.